So I'm glad you guys are here. Today we're going to be talking about how to take your church tech team from amateur to pro. Uh, a lot of times as worship teams, we are worried about the support team that we get. And the audio team, the lighting team, they're operating complicated equipment, and it's not simple to do. And often we run into problems and we feel like we're hitting up against a wall. We don't know what to do to get it to sound better or to eliminate the problems that are happening. And then we often keep having the same problems over and over and over again. So this talk is not mostly about sound or even mostly about tech, which you'll find out in just a minute. There's other things that play into supporting and giving a reason why for we're doing the tech and gives vision and direction, but we'll talk about that in just a second. So when we're coming in with volunteers, they don't often know much when they first volunteer, right? How many people have you had uh, somebody that comes up to their sound booth after church and they're like, hey, I'm a pro at this, can I join the team? Uh, I'm, I saw maybe one hand, the lights, okay. So most people don't really know what they're doing to start, but that's okay because A, we need them, and B, we can train them, right? We can put them in that spot, but how many of you guys have high turnover on your tech teams? You have people coming in, you have them serving for a while, then maybe it's not a good fit and then they move on. So professionalism helps attract the right people. It also helps keep the people in, the play, in their right place and helps you develop them into a professional team. So it's all about teamwork and how the team works together. Because how many of you have gone to run sound and there's no band there, right? How many times have you gone to turn on the lights but there's no band to light up on stage, right? Or you show up for an event and there's no tech team there and the worship team is just there trying to make lots of noise. How well did that go? So we have to work together as a team and professionalism it's the thing that's going to bind us together to create an environment for worship, right? In the big picture, we're trying to make it so that the most amount of people can have the easiest on-ramp to engage their spirits with singing songs that helps them turn their attention toward Jesus for 30 minutes, for an hour on a Sunday. It's a brief window when they're going to give their full attention to that, we hope. But how many times is there something going wrong with the technology the wrong words are on the screen, or you can't see the faces because somebody you know, forgot to turn on the lights that are in front, or there's something distracting with the audio, there's a ring of feedback that's coming on, and suddenly you're not thinking about Jesus in that moment, you're thinking about the problem that needs to be solved. So through our excellence in preparing our technology, we make it so that we're distracting people as little as possible in a world that's full of distractions in our pocket, right? That thing goes wrong and suddenly the background singer is louder than the lead vocalist, right? That's one thing that drives me nuts is I need to hear the melody out in front all the time, right? So when that happens and people get confused, they check out and they kind of, they glaze over. They don't really know exactly what they're doing, right? So we're trying to create an environment and take all the care that we can to steward that time when we have people's attention. Now, there are a few myths about professionalism that you might wonder about when I start talking about this. And some of you are like, yes, we're going to get our team in line and we're going to be functioning on all cylinders. We're going to be going for it. We're going to eliminate a lot of these problems and we're going to streamline things. And some of you are like, oh, professionalism, that feels like, like it's going to be cold and distant. And we're just going to run like a military organization. And you do what I say when I say you to do it. And you've got to perform right now. So the first myth about professionalism is that it's all business. We can act as a professional team while we keep things personal, while we operate with grace and mercy and understanding with one another, while maintaining a high professional level of expectations for our team. We can do that in the context of the church. Another myth is that professionalism is performance-based. If you don't do everything exactly right, then your value is less on our team. 
when we're going for professionalism, it's not about the way that we perform. It's about the habits and systems that we respond to the way we perform to not make the same mistake twice. So professionalism doesn't mean that you're going to have a team of all type A people that are really driven and that have to get everything just right every time, right? You can do it with people of all personality types. You can do it with people of all temperaments, all, uh, all skill levels, wherever they're at, you can invite them in to being on a professional team. The next myth is that professionalism depends on your equipment. You do not have to have really expensive gear to operate professionally. You can do it even with gear from 1995. I know. <laughs> I would cry too. But you can do your very best when you know exactly what it is that you're aiming for. You know, you can get out your digital compressor to turn the vocals up and down, right? So uh, the, uh, professionalism does not depend on your equipment. Now, the way you use your equipment to its fullest potential, that is professionalism. But the, the gear itself being, oh, I have to have this console that operates at this sample rate and this many channels and this many buses in order for us to be a professional team. If you've got an X32, you've got everything you need to operate professionally. So the first part that everybody thinks about is tech skills, right? How do we operate the stuff? And what's important. So we'll talk about that first, but there's some other components that are absolutely essential to operating as a professional team that I think are more important than the technology parts. And even if you're a novice, if you can master four basic skills on the soundboard, I don't know what those skills are for lighting and for cameras because I'm really bad at that stuff. So I can't tell you exactly what it is, but the bar is really low in order to operate professionally if you know what you're doing and you're continuing to grow. So the first one is a streamlined setup. When you create your system, you want there to be as little friction as possible for you to do the functions that you need to do. Yes, you have to care for the details about how things are labeled. When you go to set up your stage and let's say somebody, uh, somebody's bass guitar needs a second input because they want distortion and clean, right? We really have fun because we want to really rock. So if you have labeled your stage boxes and you have extra cables in a place where you can find them when you need them, you can easily facilitate setting that up so that you can execute on the vision for what the worship team and the worship leader wants for that team. So when things are well-documented, well-detailed, we've got stuff labeled, we've got spares, we've got a system for fixing stuff, that's being a good steward. That's taking care of what God's entrusted to us. Very few of us are spending money out of our own budget to buy the sound gear for the church. So it's the church congregation that's given to the Lord, and then we've spent the money on our gear. We want to take really good care of that. The other thing about a streamlined setup is it makes it a lot easier to train new people. If it's complicated, they get overwhelmed really fast, and then they say, I think I might just be an usher, right? Now, there are some people that you have to ask, you know, if, if they're not catching on within a few months and they just don't have, like, the skill to do what they're asking to do, sometimes they do have to, have you, have you considered kids' ministry? Uh, they need some help over there. Uh, another way to operate professionally is with troubleshooting. When you can have this streamlined setup, and everybody knows where every part of the system goes. Doesn't matter if it's lights, video, audio. When everybody knows the way that it's supposed to be, then when something's wrong, we can start diagnosing piece by piece in a streamlined way. We can, as leaders, give our people the plan for how to do that. Because things are going to go wrong and we're gonna to have to fix it and it's gonna be at the most inconvenient time when we have the least amount of time. The next thing you have to think about with professionalism is your limitations. 
All of us could not get on that bus, right? There's just not enough seats unless we all cram on top and then the police are gonna pull us over after somebody falls off and there's lawsuits and all that. So as a leader, if you decide you want to bring in the tuba quartet for your Easter service, you might not have enough inputs to do that. You might not have enough monitor mixers to do that. You have to be aware of what your system can do and what your system can't do and not ask it to do more than what it needs to do. So many times, tech people are problem solvers and they want to, to execute on whatever somebody else is dreaming up. So often they will bend over backwards to the detriment of their health and their family and their relationships to try to get that done. So we don't want to do that, and we don't want to ask them to push beyond their boundaries because we didn't understand what the limitations were of our system. And then finally, we have the technical tools, right? So if you're in audio, you have to worry about mic choice, mic placement, uh, balance and gain structure, using your high-pass filter and low-pass filter. If you're a camera person, you have to worry about color temperature, focus, back focus, aperture, all the exposure stuff. Lighting people have to worry about color combinations. They have to worry about the three-point lighting, backlight, and all the different things to create a different look and feel. You have to know some of that. But those, again, are not what I'm talking about today because that's a very small subset of this big topic of acting like a professional team. So with our tech skills, it's mostly about habits not specific tools. I also like this picture because it's out of polarity sine waves on those ropes, so you audio nerds can have a good laugh at that one. So when you're excellent at the other parts of professionalism, when the team is operating with certain expectations and certain systems in place that we'll talk about in just a second, that's when you can excel in growing in these habits and growing in the trade that is technical arts. Because you can't go to a weekend seminar and suddenly you're a professional sound tech, right? You could hang a diploma up on your wall and people call up somebody like, okay, I'm ready to go on tour with you. And they're like, who are you? It doesn't matter what you've done in a weekend. It's a skill that takes time from learning from others that have gone before you. It's not gonna happen overnight, but we can build the habits that make that grow in our skills with our technical tools. The next section that we're gonna talk about is leadership. The way that we create the environment or set the stage for technical artists to come and serve the congregation is another key component of acting like a professional team. Some of you might be familiar with Simon Sinek. He's, his TED Talks start with why. Right? So at the very center of what we do as an organization is why we do it. Then outside of that, we have how we do it. And then finally, bigger than that is what we do. And when you start with the why, when you start at the very center and move out, you have a reason for the things that you're doing. You have internal motivation because you know why you're spending that extra time to label those cables. You're spending that extra time to go through the set list and create more scenes for your lighting console. You're doing all of that because you know that it, it matters for the people that are coming. It matters for the environment that we're creating to help people worship. So for my adaptation of this, we have leadership at the very center of this. This is the why, and this is the, the, the meaning behind what we value why are we gathering the way that we're gathering? Why do we choose the production values that we chose for our worship gathering? Is it lights up or is it lights down during worship? Do we have moving lights or do we have a static look? All these things uh, are answered at the leadership level. And so if you're on staff at the church or if you're a worship leader, this is you getting together with your pastor and really defining what it is that these things are for our worship services. Then outside of that, we have professionalism. That's the habits that we're, we're forming. This is how we operate as a team. This is how we talk to one another and how we prepare. This is how we talk to one another when somebody doesn't prepare. And then outside of that are the tech skills. 
Uh, the, the keynotes this morning were fantastic. Uh, Daisy did a great job of drawing out this same thing with we're hiring for professionalism. We're hiring for or giving opportunities to people with professionalism or people who are hunger for, hungry for spiritual formation more so than we're putting people in positions for their technical skills. So a, a different facet of the same diamond of that nugget of wisdom is looking at it from a professionalism angle when a daisy was looking at it from a spiritual formation angle. We have to develop a common language for what it is that we're trying to achieve with our worship services. Uh, what does in your face mean with a mix, right? Can anybody give me a number or a statistic or a SPL meter reading that says, okay, this is in your face, right? Up to 11, right? What does big feel like? What is too loud? When someone comes up to the sound booth and they always come up to the sound booth and say, it's too loud, what does that really mean? What does it? Does it mean that there's a drum kit in the same zip code and they're grumpy about it? Or does it mean that the vocals are way too far out in front because your sound booth is back on the ball and you can't hear them clearly so you push it up and now it's like it's right up here and they're upset about that. So is it the bass levels? Do they just not like feeling bass but other people do? So when we identify common language for the way that we're talking about all these things that have to do with feelings, right? The way our audio mix comes across, the way the arrangement of the band is put together, the way that the lights come together, all of those contribute to feelings that we have a hard time putting concrete language on. So the clearer we can get with the objectives that we have with language, we can point a picture for our team. Another one is wisdom and priorities. How many of you have had an update when the computer should be displaying something on the projector? <laughs> so yes, it is important for security to update your computer, but it's not important enough for Sunday morning. So eventually something will go wrong and hopefully it's not a catastrophic thing. But when the catastrophic thing goes wrong, have you talked about as a team what's most important to fix first? So imagine you come to church on Sunday morning and you boot up the console for a rehearsal and it's blank. Your scenes, your presets, everything set up is not working. That would cause me to stress sweat immediately. And after I go splash cold water on my face, I would come up with a plan, right? So this is a freebie for audio. The most important thing that you have to amplify are the voices at church. So your singers and your pastor. If it's somebody up on stage strumming an acoustic guitar and that acoustic guitar is just acoustic in your room, so be it. People will follow along with singing. Everything else is just gravy, right? So we have to know, like, I don't have to go and fix the second keyboard's right channel in the middle of a service if my vocals can't be heard, right? So we have to have wisdom and priorities and communicate that ahead of time, right? When your team knows what to do, they're going to get a lot less stressed when that thing goes wrong, and they're going to not have to shoulder all that burden as a volunteer, as an amateur, and they're like, hey, what am I doing? Right. The next thing you have to have is clear expectations. We have to talk about often and repeatedly what it is that it should feel like in our church services. What are we going for? What do we want people to encounter when they come in, whether that's the seasoned believer that's been going to that church for 20 years, or if it's somebody brand new off the street, wandered in because their life's in crisis, and now they're looking to church for help. How do we want to present our worship service so that the brand new believer or even unbeliever that's just kind of trying to check things out? How do we want our church services to feel for them in all the different aspects of our technology and our worship team? 
We'll continue on with the training in one moment, but first I wanna tell you more about our Churchfront Live conference. The video you're watching right now was captured at a previous Churchfront Live event. Churchfront Live is a two-day conference specifically for worship and production leaders. Go to churchfrontlive.com to learn more about when and where the next event is happening. And you can register your team today. The sooner, the better you can register to take advantage of the early bird discounts. So go to churchfrontlive.com to learn more and register. And let's continue on with the training. When we know what winning is, we can head for it, right? When we know where the center of the target is, we know how to course correct, so when we have a clear expectation of what it should be like, it makes it a whole lot easier to shift from where things are to where you want them to be. Maybe you've had this experience where somebody new has come in on your tech team and they think they have an idea of how everything should be fixed. And so everything gets thrown out the window with the level of the kick drum and the bass guitar and the electric guitar are all now at 11, and you can hear the lead vocal, but kinda, and then the background vocals and acoustic guitar just disappeared, right? So that person had an idea of what it should be like, and that varies genre to genre, right? The, the things that work at your church might not work at your church, right? Because you have different people, and you have different cultures, and you have to serve that in order to make it that easy on-ramp for people to come in and engage in worship. When you've talked about with clear language what those clear expectations are, then you can say, hey, we really value having it at a level where people can't really hear the person singing next to them and so that people can sing loud. That might be one of your values. Yes, that's you. Other people might say, you know what? We like hearing other people sing around us because it makes us feel like we are all together worshiping, not just they're on stage worshiping and we're out here listening. So we want the levels to be at a place where when everybody's singing, everybody can hear everybody singing. When you clarify that, when you make it easy for people to know this is how loud it should be, or, hey, come out here and walk with me in the middle of worship and let's listen to what it sounds like out there. And are we hitting that mark? When you can ask that, it eliminates this. You're doing it too loud, you need to turn it down. Too loud for what? What are we aiming for? Do we just look at the SPL meter? So I'm a big fan of SPL meters, but they don't tell the whole story. They don't tell the feeling story. They can't differentiate the, dif the difference between a loud vocal and a loud electric guitar. So how do you identify what's right? You have to clarify that for your team. You have to clarify it for your lighting team, for your video team. What do we like to do to connect people who are watching online with the way that we switch between our close camera and our wide shot? How are we doing that and what's our value for that? When you clarify it, it's easy to correct. It also depersonalizes it. You're not attacking a person and saying, you did this wrong. It's, hey, our value is this. I don't think we're hitting the mark. How do we shift to go this way? Doesn't that feel a whole lot better? I would love to be talked to that way when I make a mistake. The last thing is clear metrics. Oops. How do we measure success? So how then do we celebrate when we do get success? So many times as tech people, we get treated like offensive linemen in football. When we do our jobs awesome, nobody says a word. Everybody else gets the credit. Everybody else gets the big stats. Everybody else is wanted on their fantasy football team. The offensive line, when they mess up, ooh, their name is Mud. Everybody knows when the offensive line messes up. Everybody knows when the pro presenter person messes up. Everybody knows when the sound tech messes up. It's pretty clear. So we have to know what success is so that we can be each other's best cheerleader. So as the worship leader, you can say, hey, I heard from a bunch of people that they really felt like they could sing and engage with worship today. Thank you 
for taking the extra time to dial in those vocals. Thank you for, uh, for making sure that you knew the songs ahead of time so that you knew when that instrumental part came up, you could push up that melody that everybody started singing when the electric guitar started playing it. Those are the kinds of things that we can do when we know what success is. On the flip side of this, uh, I have a story to tell about some friends that were doing sound for a big conference. So this ministry that I was serving at, we do a big conference at the end of the year. 15 to 20,000 people come, and we've always hired out the audio services because it's a big event and a big PA, and for many, many years, the audio team was just not that great. But over the years, as the audio team got better and got more and more experience, some of these guys had been pining to mix for this conference for 10 years. And so they finally get their chance. They finally convince the conference leadership. They say, hey, we really want to jump in and do audio. I really think we can handle it. We've been really nailing it in these settings for these other regional conferences. We've been doing a great job. Let us at it. So they acquiesced. They said, okay. Okay. Most of the time at these conferences with the pros that come in from the outside, the mix is okay to start, right? It takes a while to get dialed in. You're on a big PA. You're with bands that you don't know. The bands are switching out because there's different worship teams uh, every session. Sometimes there's the same worship team for two sessions, but it's hard to get stuff dialed in when you've got a new team all the time. And you're on a big PA and you've got a limited amount of time, right? It's not like you get to rehearse for weeks and weeks ahead of time. So that was normal, and when the audio guys in-house started, that was pretty typical. But they had a different idea about what the Sonics should be like on a feeling level, right? Uh, how many of you are familiar with John Mayer's Continuum album? Okay. And how many are familiar with his Heavier Things album, right? So those are drastically different Sonics, right? Heavier Things is very much pop in your face, super compressed, like you hit play and it just the lights are just turned on and it's in your face the whole time. Continuum has a lot more dynamics. It's a lot punchier. This team was going for the Continuum punchy dynamics kind of big round feeling type mix. But that wasn't what the conference leadership wanted, but nobody found out about that until after they let the in-house guys go after the third session. So the second day into this conference, these audio guys are crushed. Their dream that they've wanted to do for 10 years has now been taken from them. The monitor engineer came and mixed front of house and mixed a in-your-face pop-type sound. And that's what the conference leadership wanted, but everybody just assumed the other person knew what they wanted. So those assumptions about feelings don't serve you well. So when you make it unclear, when you don't give that leadership of this is what we want it to feel like, and you don't repeat yourself often, people won't get it and people won't hit the mark. And thankfully, your church services are not this like golden moment that you've been waiting for for a long time, but you can see what happens when you don't do those habits and you don't take the time to really make it clear what it is that it should sound like. So we want to set our tech teams up for success, not disappointment, and then we can talk about how we get there. The third section is our interpersonal skills. This is how we relate to one another. So when we're on a team, there is going to be communication. There's going to be hopefully preparation or lack thereof, and that's kind of a bummer when there's no preparation. But you can tell when there's no preparation as a worship leader. There's going to be all kinds of things where we have to relate to one another. And we have to do it in love and with wisdom. The first personal skill that you need as a team, that you need to just put your flag in the ground and say, we are going to be teachable. The second that we think we know everything, we have stunted our own growth and we're plateaued. And that's a dangerous place to be. Some of you are brand new in your tech field or maybe you're brand new on the worship team. And it feels like everything is new and you're growing all the time. 
But once you start to master some of those skills, once you start to really hone it in and you're like, man, I'm sounding pretty good. Man, I make those lights look really good. Those lights really felt like we aimed to do. It looked like the guy that trained me. I feel like I'm doing a good job. The temptation there is to say, I don't need any more. I'm okay. You can't tell me what to do anymore. I've arrived. And it's easy to see from the outside. That's why you guys struggle, right? You've probably encountered somebody like that at some point. So being teachable starts with being able to receive feedback. Then it goes to seeking feedback. Uh, there's a good book. Uh, I think it's How to Be a Sideman. It's by Zorro the Drummer. Uh, he's a believer, but he plays drums with like Lenny Kravitz and you know, professionals and stuff. But he talked about how as his professional career developed, he would invite other pro musicians to come to shows that he's already gotten the gig for the show and he would ask those pro musicians to give him feedback. He would almost beg them to give him feedback. And that's how he kept growing. You can't just stay stagnant. You have to be teachable, but also always growing, always looking for something else that you can improve. Uh, one of the skills in this is active listening. Tell me more about how you felt like it was too loud in this part. Was it this instrument or that instrument? Or was it a tonal thing? Did you feel like it was nasally or kind of piercing there? Or was there a bass frequency? Try to draw out of other people what it is that is making them say something to you. So we're not just asking for feedback, we're drawing it out. We're asking, please help me get better so that I can serve better. Because remember, we're serving as unto the Lord. We're not serving our earthly masters. We're not serving worship leaders. We're not serving the senior pastor. We're serving Jesus who remembers everything that we do, even the little cup of cold water. I bet notching out feedback and spending that extra few minutes to make sure that something's not ringing is going to be on that list underneath cup of cold water, right? So it's also the fruit of separating your identity from your role. When you can say, the job that I did is not who I am, you can say, hey, how can I make this better? Because you're not worried about your value. You're not worried about what you bring to the team or your facade of what you bring to the team and you're just kind of like, I'm still kind of faking it and it's just been a good worship team. So our tech teams aren't just service personnel, they're creative technical artists. Write that one down. Our tech teams aren't just service personnel, they're creative technical artists. And we have to grow in our artistry. And it's a thing that develops and it can be easy to take it to a place of identity where I feel like what I do is who I am. But when we seek out feedback and we're teachable, we can say, my value is in that God loves me. I love God. I have a family and a church team that I can run with and do ministry with. They love me regardless of my performance. So I can take feedback about what could have been better and I can seek it out. Uh, another thing that's really helpful for interpersonal skills is when things do go wrong, keeping a level head. I mean, there's going to be that time when everything blows up and you have to be able to keep a good attitude when it does because it's not the end of the world. Jesus is still on the throne even if your sound system is not working. Even if all your lights are dark, Jesus is still on the throne. And it's okay. So we can keep a good attitude we cannot infect the other people around us with a negative attitude when things go wrong. So look out for that and be able to call that out and say, hey, this is an opportunity for us to grow in that. I know that stinks. I'm bummed about it too, but let's choose our attitude in it. The other thing is when we deal with conflict, there will be conflict. There will be a difference of opinion there might be that person that obviously comes unprepared or they don't know the words to that song and when the confidence monitor goes down, they're just clueless, they're humming. We have to be able to deal with conflict in a positive way. We resolve it, we don't ignore it, 
And we know how to de-escalate it when emotions get riled up, right? We can separate ourselves from the conflict and say, okay, I need a breather from this. We need to resolve this. But let me calm down so that I don't have to say something that I'm going to apologize for later. Anger buried is buried alive. That's not mine. That's Dr. Gary Smalley. But if you let little things fester and they don't get resolved on your team, that's when little snippy comments start coming out when somebody asks for a change in the monitor mix or there is a correction about the lighting or, hey, this cue doesn't quite look right for that song, right? So when you deal with things when they're small, they never get big. And so many of us um, in our generation do not have the father and mother that showed us how to deal with conflict well, right? Uh, our generation is one that has the most fatherlessness for fathers that aren't dead, right? So we have fathers that are alive but just not present. So, so many people in our church communities have come from a place where they didn't see conflict resolved in a healthy way in their home. This is one place where we start to minister to the tech team, not just through the tech team. When we can teach people, this is how we deal with stuff when a conflict arises. We go to the person in private. We say, I feel statements. Hey, I feel like when you said that, it was an attack on me. I trust you didn't think that. I trust that you meant the best, but it felt like that. Can you tell me more about what you were feeling or what you were thinking when you said that? Those little things that we can do to grow in the way that we relate to one another make it so that little things stay little. When the fire comes, we're not yelling at each other. We're working together to solve it. So here's some things that you can do to take action to take your team pro, right? So it starts with this. Start with your leadership angle. What is our vision for how the tech team should operate? What are we going to clarify in our expectations and our goals? We start at the very middle and we move our way outward. We make it really clear what it is. And this is going to take some time with you and a notepad journaling to figure out what that is. If you're the worship leader and you're leading the tech team, if you're a tech on the team or you run a team of techs, you have to know how does this and how do we have clear objectives for how our church's mission is being fulfilled? How are we serving those in our community? How are we reaching out to the people that are right around us for whom God has called us to serve? How does our worship ministry fit into that? How do we serve that mission? And so what are the objectives for how we go about making that happen? Then you move on to professionalism. You make it really clear. How do we operate as a team? What is the, the code of conduct for on this team, how we're going to resolve conflict? When that person shows up and they're unprepared for rehearsal, what do you say to them? So the goal is to give your team clarity. The more you write it down, the more you speak it, and the more you try to distill it into quick sound bites that people can remember, they're going to have a lot easier time retaining that and sticking to what it is that you're trying to teach them. Then you also have to lead the culture. You have to be the one demonstrating the things that you want to see. The cool thing about this is once you demonstrate it enough times, the people around you are going to start to catch on and you're not the only person talking about it anymore. You're not the only person saying, hey, this is how we resolve conflict. Or, hey, I saw the way that you responded when so-and-so asked for this. I think we could have done that better. I think we could have honored them a little bit better than that. Even though that was a, a tough situation, I think it would be awesome if you went and apologized for that. Like a Daisy said this morning, if you leave it passive, it's not going to be healthy. If you don't actively make a professional culture where we treat one another with respect, it's going to devolve into disrespect. Or we just keep it at a surface level and we just bury those little things and move on and nobody gets really close. Uh, one thing that's really handy is to listen to music together. If you're part of the music team or the audio team, 
or even the lighting team. Maybe you watch a video of another church that's done that for your lighting people and say, I love the way that they set the mood for this. Observing what you want to emulate, not saying copy this, but observing and calling out the values. I like how they did this, or I like how they highlighted just the worship leader on stage with the lights. When the band came in, I liked how they, they brought up the lights on the rest of the band. Talking about your values in a way that's creatively approachable makes it easier for people to know that's my target. Right? And then you also have to just do the technical training. You have to set up your team for success. You have to put in the hours that it takes to make things well-organized, to create systems that lack that friction we talked about in the beginning, to teach people what the tools are and how they're best used, focusing on the values for your technical presentation, not necessarily exactly the way we got there. Uh, at the International House of Prayer, there's a bunch of different worship teams and a bunch of different people that mix, right? So often I would be in the room doing my prayer room hours and somebody else would be mixing. I thought they were doing a great job. So I would walk back to the sound booth and tell them, hey, you're doing an awesome job. And then I would look at their screen and I would see their vocal EQ and I was appalled. <laughs> you did that to your vocals on that frequency? But just a second ago, I was happy with their mix, right? So when we get into the nitty gritty of like, no, you must do it this way, that's micromanaging. If we say these are the values and we want the vocals to be clear and out in front, we want them to be well supported by the band, we want it to feel a certain way, then we get into you can use the tools in a way however you want to get to this result. But if you're not getting to this result, we have a step-by-step a, a -step plan for how we can get to there and let me train you how to do that. But we don't have to make you do it exactly the way that I do it. So tech ministry is through those who serve and to those who serve, right? The multitudes came and went from Jesus, but he has 12 disciples with him all the time. And the multitudes were taught, but his disciples were his disciples, right? The trained ones. So the team that you're doing ministry with is also the team that you're doing ministry to. So imagine somebody's on your team and he's a dad, he's got a family, he's working hard at his job, but he keeps losing jobs. And his marriage is kind of on the rocks because he never learned how to do conflict in a positive way. But through your team and through setting up these expectations and saying, hey, as a team, this is one of our values. We're going to go through one of our values before we start worship practice and just talk about that every week so that it's part of our culture, it's on the forefront of our mind, and everybody knows what we're doing. Everybody knows what our values are and what we stand for. And through that time, this man learns how to not blow a gasket when something goes wrong and somebody calls him out for something he did. And over time, he learns to do that, not just on the worship team, but at home with his wife and his children. And... The job that he got because he lost the last one because he went off, he's actually kept this job for a long time and he's moving up. And not that success in your career is everything, but it can be the fruit of good roots and good values and being discipled through the good news of Jesus Christ, through understanding that your identity is not where you came from, but it's who God's called you to be and when you see that in somebody and you call it out, you say, I think you can come higher in this and I believe in you, that's when we change lives one at a time to our tech team, not just somebody serving in a technical role. So what steps can you take? You're gonna get a lot of stuff to do after this conference. You're probably gonna go home and have way too many ideas to put into practice all at once. What I don't want you to do is to be the drill sergeant that comes in and says, now we are going to act professionally. <laughs> no. How do you think that's going to go over? <laughs> Not too well. 
we have to take these baby steps and they have to start in our office or at the coffee shop with the notepad and figuring out what are our values and how are we going to lead our team into operating in a professional way? How are we going to do it in a way that showcases Jesus, not just in our Sunday service, but in the way that we love one another on the team that facilitates that? Habakkuk 2.2, you're probably familiar with it. It says, write the vision down and make it plain so that he can run who reads it. So when you make the vision for your team operating professionally plain, when you distill it down into as few words as possible so that it's easy for people to remember and understand and then turn into actions, that's going to move it in the right direction, right? So it starts with you understanding and clarifying what it is that winning is, how we're going to treat one another on our team and developing those values. It's going to start on paper first. And then maybe you, you do that thing where, hey, we're going to talk about what some of our values are at the beginning of worship practice. Or at the end of worship practice, we're going to just talk about this. We're going to build it into our habits so that as we go slowly, little by little, we start to turn the ship of our team and the culture starts to change. You also have to model the values first. So maybe where there's a place where you avoid conflict, you choose to do conflict the right way. and You choose to go and apologize the right way before it's a week later and you're shooting off that email. So model the values after you write them down. Now, I do have a free guide that you can download. This is specific for sound, but it can be adapted to any area in your tech team. It's called How to Lead Your Church Sound Team. It walks you through step-by-step how to put language to all the different attributes of what the mix is like, how to operate as a team, and then how to, uh, how to evaluate what you're doing and how you can get better as a team. Uh, it's a free download. It's there on that QR code. So we've talked about the stuff that you can do, and you can go download this guide to give you a little step-by-step after the conference. But there's other times when you need a specialist to come in. So many of our churches, we don't have full-time tech people or even part-time paid tech people or even a volunteer that can spare a few more hours to come in and clean stuff up, right? We're, we're happy to have somebody that can come in and operate it, much less do all the maintenance and stuff. So there are times when we need to bring in a specialist to make something simple where it's been complicated. Uh, raise your hand if you've been part of an install where you install something and then, oh, we need this and then we need this and then we need this and now it's a convoluted mess and to touch anything, you're afraid it's all going to break. Right? Uh, yeah, me too. So there are times when you need a pro to say, okay, this is complicated. Help me make this simple to reduce our friction. Uh, obviously, you need a specialist for safety things, electrical, rigging, like don't make anybody die. Uh, complex upgrades, that's when you need a specialist. And sometimes you need a specialist for training because if you're a worship leader, it's very unlikely that you took a sound course. How many worship leaders have taken a sound course outside of Jake? Okay, awesome. That's three. So what qualifies you or what puts you in as qualified in the eyes of the young person that's coming in to learn to run sound, what qualifies you to tell them what to do? If you don't have the tools, you don't have to fake it. You can bring in a specialist to help train. There's also the uh, phenomenon that happens with young adults, also known teen as teenagers, where mom and dad don't know anything, and they can be told something over and over and over again, but then, like, third party comes in, and they're like, oh, yeah, you should do that, and they're like, they're so smart. Same thing happens, right? Uh, sometimes you just need somebody else's authority to come in and say, yeah, that, that really is the way that it is. You should follow this four-step process for EQing your vocals because they're not clear the way that you're doing it. Right? So that can be really helpful uh, for training. And trainers often know how to explain it in a bunch of different ways rather than just the one way that you figured out how to do it. Uh, so that can be really helpful as well. And finally, culture and training multiplies. 
This might seem like a lot of work at the beginning, and it is a lot of work. It's a lot of thinking. It's a lot of journaling. It's a lot of telling people the same thing over and over and over again before they even start to get it. But that seed that you plant and nurture grows into another plant that bears fruit. Then the seed goes out, and it grows again, and it bears more fruit. So the training and the values and the things that you put in place multiply and grow over time. You're not going to be sorry that you spent the time with that notepad writing these things down. You're not going to be sorry that you brought in somebody to train your team and give you those tools that then they can teach somebody else to do. You don't have to do that again. Or you can do it again and take them to the next level. But uh, when you model the behavior, people then start to say themselves when they see something that's outside of your values, that's not how we do things here. Let me show you how to do it. The weight is not all on your shoulders when you're modeling values, when you're teaching values. It's like a big flywheel that you got to push on, and it's really hard to move at first. And you keep pushing the same pressure on it, and you're trying to go around and around and around. This feels so hard. I can't do this. But eventually, the momentum that you built from that one rotation is still going. And so then you're pushing just as hard as you can still, but it keeps going faster, and you're using the same amount of effort, but there's a lot more force going along with you. That's what culture and training do for your ministry. So one more time, if you need that QR code, if you missed it before, uh, how to lead your church sound team. There it is for you guys. Thank you guys for paying attention, not falling asleep after lunch. It's a great thing. So thank you guys. Thanks so much for watching this video. Hit that thumbs up button and share it with your friends in worship ministry if you found it helpful. I'm sure they're going to find it helpful as well. And don't forget to check out churchfrontlive.com where you can learn more about our two-day conference for worship and production leaders, and you can register your team today.